Okay, everyone, you can come back in. All right, I think everybody is, yeah, everybody is joining us. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the seventh stream of School of Resistance, a uh, live stream format that invites experts on change around the world to discuss valuable alternatives for our future and also to create a blueprint for politics of resistance. The project is a collaboration between NT Gent, IRPM, Academie der Kunste Berlin, Kulturstiftung des Bundes, and HowlRound Theater Commons. Today's episode is called Environmental Repercussions, Living in a Compromised World. When a recent UN report noted that the 47% CO2 emission drop caused by the coronavirus would have to be replicated every year until 2030 in order to control the climate crisis, it seems like the modern world opened Pandora's box. From predictions of mass flooding and waterborne diseases to uninhabitable temperatures and irreparable destruction to biodiversity, visions of the future are bleak. Together with the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, Gail Bradbrook, uh, the Canadian philosopher Alexis Shotwell, and the climate justice activist Alice Swift, we are very happy to discuss their strategies of resistance uh, and environmental visions, looking for ways where they converge and reinforce each other. My, way, my name is Elin Banke, and I am very happy and very honored as well to introduce our guests of tonight's conversation. Our first guest is Dr. Gail Bradbrook. Uh, she's a co-founder of the social movement Extinction Rebellion, which uh, rapidly spread internationally since its launch in October 2018. And having been researching, planning and training for mass civil disobedience already since 2010, and having been arrested for four times for acts of civil disobedience, Gail is a pivotal figure in the world of climate activism. Our second guest for tonight is Alexis Shotwell. She's a professor at Carleton University on unceded Algonquin territory. She's a co-investigator for the AIDS Activist History Project and author of Knowing Otherwise, Race, Gender and Implicit Understanding and also Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Times. Our third guest for tonight is uh, Alice Swift and she's a British climate justice activist. She's working on a PhD at the University of Manchester on social reproduction in the European climate camp movement, mainly focusing on Andy Galenda and the UK equivalent Reclaim the Power. She's interested in uh, how autonomous left infrastructures feeds into protest camps and how strategies, tactics and ideology develop and travel between national boundaries. She's a co-founder of the UK fossil free divestment movement and a member of the anti-capitalist organization Plan C. Before we start this conversation, I quickly want to remind the people of the possibility for uh, them to engage in our conversation by asking questions. For everyone who is watching live on uh, Facebook, uh, for instance, you can comment just on the live stream immediately, or uh, you can also uh, send your questions uh, by email, uh, which you can send to our email address, schoolofresistance.be or on Twitter, you can use the hashtag School of Resistance. Having said all this, I think uh, we can finally maybe uh, start with our conversation. Um, to open up this talk, I, I would like to quote uh, a thought from uh, one of the essays of uh, Alexis Shotwell I already referred to, namely the, uh, the essay Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Times. Um, it's an essay in which Alexis questions the belief that in order to live authentically or ethically, one should avoid potentially reprehensible results in our actions. Uh, because, and I quote, we are compromised and we have made compromises and this will continue to be the way we craft the worlds to come, whatever they turn out, might, whatever they might turn out to be, sorry. Um, Alexis, could you maybe elaborate on, uh, on this idea of what you mean when you say that we are compromised and that our actions are always going to be compromised? And could you maybe also explain how this way of thinking manifests itself uh, in the current climate crisis? Yes. Thank you so much for that question and um, for hosting this. It's a real honor to be here. Um, so I think of being compromised in a couple of different ways. Um, one is 
we can say that um, having porous boundaries, um, not being able to make firm delineations, being vulnerable to the world, that we're compromised in that sense. We're not um, impervious. We're pervious and porous. And that's just the basic condition of our life. And when we start thinking about being compromised like that, we can actually feel that that is, um, allows us a way in to understanding how uh, interdependent we are with the world. So how um, in the world we are, how of a piece with it we are. Uh, so that everything we take in becomes part of us, we're always connected. So we're compromised like that. And actually when we look at it that way, that's a form of being compromised that we can love, that we can feel nourished by. The other way that we're compromised though, is that we make compromises. Um, we're complicit in uh, things and um, really by, by things here, I mean horrific harm, um, terrible, uh, grief striking uh, pain that we would like to not be involved in. So um, we make compromises in the sense that we are forced to be compromised our, in, our, in our ethical core, our ethical and political core. We are made by this world to not be able to be not complicit. So um, the, the being embodied and alive means that if we care about the world on some level, we're already uh, hypocrites. And this is a favorite uh, point <laughs> for people who are um, actively excited that the world is ending, who are profiting from the devastation of the world, who feel like they can distribute the harm and death away from them. When, when we who care about the world say, I care about the world, they will say, but you're such a hypocrite, you drove a car. Or, um, you know, it turns out that lamb is better for this particular bioregion to eat than, you know, you can't grow soybeans in Ireland, right? So in my work, one of the things that I'm very interested in is asking, what happens if we start from the view that we're complicit and compromised and we cannot be pure? What happens if we say, aiming for purity is actually the problem? And we take every place at which we're complicit and we use that as an anchor point for action and as a place to get traction. So every place that we know we want this world to be otherwise, maybe we can start there. So that's how I think about compromise. And I know we're gonna talk more um, about it, but to give away what I think is the, the like how or next, the only way we can do that is by acting collectively. Like individual purity and action isn't ever going to help us or this world. Um, so the, the way that it's so wonderful to be here with um, folks who are actively connecting with Plan C and with XR is just, these are some of the models for how we're thinking about refusing individual purity and committing to collective action. Yes, I would like to pick up on this idea actually of this collective action of this envisioning how the world could be differently um, by going to our two climate activists to Alice and, uh, and Gail um, looking at this idea of, of being compromised and our actions potentially having reprehensible results. My questions to you would be um, how you'd react on this thought of, uh, and if you could perhaps also illustrate how this manifests in your own methodology, uh, what your activism in order to fight um, fossil capitalism, what it looks like. Mm. I don't know if one of you wants to start, go ahead. Yeah, I can start. Thank you for sharing that so beautifully. And I'm really enjoying the 
uh, female energy in this space somehow um, as part of that. Um, I've, I've been fortunate to be coached and, and, and working alongside Mickey Kashtan, M-I-K-I Kashtan, if, if people have come across her work. And to think about patriarchy as showing up as the mentality of scarcity, of separation and of powerlessness gives me a, a check for where I'm at with respect to feeling compromised with respect to relating to other people. Um, because, I mean, I think many of us who've been on the journey of activism, well, I'm just going to own my own side. I've certainly been in that space of feeling quite self-righteous and judgmental and, you know, all the rest of it, and then feeling judged and not good enough. It's all of these things create separation between us. And, um, we, I, I think that another way of saying what Alexis was saying is that we're all deeply traumatized by the world that we're living in. Some of us have got specific traumas, uh, but the trauma is like an ongoing thing. It's not just like childhood trauma. Um, so how do you, how do we respond in, in, in living in such a world? I mean, again, another way Mickey put it that I found really helpful was to do purpose med trauma healing. So if we have a purpose to work with a certain group in a certain way or, you know, you know, focus on climate justice in a certain whatever it is, what's in the way of us showing up in the best possible way? What what element of our trauma is is, is showing up, um, which could include uh, white racism. It could include uh, feeling small as a working class woman or whatever it is, you know, so there's opportunities to work there as individuals. And I think that's a, another piece from Mickey's work is the both and rather than the either or. There's so much on the progressive left that comes at us as an either or, and it's immediately in separation. So either you're saying this or you're saying that, what if, what if we can have more both ands? So as an example, uh, you know, part of Extinction Rebellion comes from um, some of us who have a more spiritual leaning. And I know that that can really show up as like indulgence. It looks very indulgent, you know. So where's the place where it's both and, you know, where we can do our trauma work whilst keeping the focus on the activism? Did you just see what I mean? So, the, and, and, and the other place that I lean into with Mickey is thinking that when we're working against patriarchy it involves vulnerability um, it involves tenderness for each other and mourning for what we what we get wrong you know really grieving for what we get wrong and I, I, I think that that's part of what we've tried to build into some of the ways that we work together in Extinction Rebellion, and I'm not trying to pretend we get it right, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, could I come back or feed back on some of those things? Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you're mentioning, you know, patriarchy and, you know, white structures and stuff like that, Gail, because I think, you know, I mean, you'll you'll be the first to know about uh, the intense amount of criticism that Extinction Rebellion has received, um, and I guess uh, when I when I so I'm I'm very critical of Extinction Rebellion, um, and I just want to kind of come with it with some clarity, which is that I have a level of critical engagement with Extinction Rebellion. So I think, kind of, you know, on the spectrum of uh, like environmental activists or other activists relationship to Extinction Rebellion. You've kind of got the people that have, have found a new home with it and have just gone headfirst into it. You've got the people on the other side who won't touch it with a barge pole. And I'm somewhere in the middle, which is like a level of critical engagement. And I guess the thing is that like, it comes from a sense of love. It comes from a sense of, you know, we're, we're fighting the same fight. We're fighting for the same things. Um, it seems, or that's how I believe it to be the case. Um, and uh, I, I want to recognise the um, 
the incredible work that Extinction Rebellion has done in activating a whole layer of people that weren't previously involved with the climate struggle or with ecological struggle. And I think this comes back to the, um, the notion of purity politics and kind of individualism. And one of the things that I really want to give Extinction Rebellion a lot of kudos for is um, kind of, I think, what has been so fantastic to see is in the huge mobilization effort that, um, you know, you and others and other people, you know, doing the kind of um, the talk going around the UK, um, you know, extinction and, and what to do about it. I think it's something to that effect. What's been so fantastic about that is I think you've really positively tapped into a lot of the pre-existing environmental um, kind of scenes or communities that, that, that exist within the UK in terms of really making that cognitive shift for a lot of people in going, okay, you know, as much as your like gardening project or, um, you know, you cycling lots is a really good thing. There is a limit to the extent to which an individual um, lifestyle change can really affect change. And I think that that cognitive shift that's been achieved with Extinction Rebellion is, is one that is incredibly valuable for the climate movement and the climate movement internationally, I'd say most particularly in the UK, but it's that shift away from like the purity politics, the individual lifestyleism, to a recognition that in order to achieve uh, change within our economy and our society and our political sphere that we need collective action and so I, I really want to I really want to make that really clear that I'm I'm really grateful for XR with that um, it's essentially a game changer for the climate movement and I think that a lot of climate activists like me that have been involved for a long time I've been a climate activist for 10 years um, we're having to like recalibrate in relation to XR because there's so much that has been achieved but by the same token I think and I also I, I want to give credit where credit is due XR is being reflexive enough or well perhaps not enough in my opinion but it is being reflexive in talking about um, other systems of oppression like you know patriarchal social relations or racist social relations um, but I guess the problem is is that when um, the kind of the notion um, that um, we kind of the theory of change that is based on the 3.5 percent rule of um, Stefan and Chenoweth it really kind of it has manifested in a way that valorizes um, just a kind of very scientific understanding of, of climate change and devoid from the social realities that have created it, namely fossil fuel capitalism and the way it intersects with race and um, gender and all of those things. And so um, I guess my concern is with making a lot of those mistakes um, where there's potential for joining up or where there's been potential for actually connecting struggles, a lot of those bridges already seem to have been burned. Um, and I guess that's, yeah, as someone that's looking as an outsider into XR, it's deeply concerning. And I think, uh, you know, XR, if you, if you, the, that language of XR talks about the, um, the structure, the structure of society, um, the structure, the, um, oh no, no, sorry, not, not the structure, the system, the system of society, the system. But if you go to an XR activist and you ask them, what, what is the system? There'll be a plethora of whole different responses. You know, what is the system that it is that you're pointing to? Some people will say it's overconsumption. Some people will say that it's, um, you know, the system of our democracy or government or whatever. Some people will, will say whatever. But for me, really, the overarching thing is it's a capitalist system. And a climate justice oriented approach uh, necessarily looks at the way in which the, the climate crisis is a manifestation of the fossil capitalist system, that it's the fossil capitalist system that's got us here in the first place. And that we can't understand the injustice of climate change when, unless we look at the injustice climate change distributes onto people of the global south, of working class communities in the global north and the global south, that people of colour, black and minority ethnic people are the worst to suffer. Um, and 
when those intersections aren't aren't deliberately played out for fear of putting people off, for um, fear of it's too radical, people can't understand. I think you end up doing um, a disservice to to these people that you've really had this cognitive shift, you know, like it's an appreciation of how clever people can be to understand a the severity of the climate crisis the urgency of it and then b recognize the need to be part of a social movement and i guess where i stand is that they haven't completed that journey they're still at the beginning of that journey and that necessarily the kind of the logical conclusion of that journey is recognizing how climate change is inextricably linked to capitalism, to patriarchal social relations, to racism, and that we can't understand the climate crisis without understanding those things as well. And um, and certainly that's the approach that Reclaim the Power takes and the approach that Ender Glenda takes is a very much climate justice oriented um, mode of thinking about the, the crisis and a mode of, of operating as well. So for instance, in Reclaim the I mean, Power Life, oh, sorry. Well, just because yeah. like, I want to ask about this because my collective here in the Canadian context, when we read Plan C, and this is also something maybe for Gail, um, and, and I don't know enough about Reclaim the Power, so I, I want to hear this. But here we've spent a lot of time reflecting on what is different in the Canadian context about how we think about what the system is, right? So I'm part of an anarchist collective, tiny one called Punch Up, um, aside from being an academic. And we said, well, you know, one of the things that is absolutely different about reading this here, if we were trying to be Plan C, if we were trying to write this here in the North American context, we would identify uh, colonialism and border imperialism as the sort of like, or maybe colonialism, capitalism, and border imperialism as the intertwining. We could not think about it uh, separate from indigenous resistance and indigenous sovereignty. And so one of the things that I think about a lot is how the places that we're organizing and the work that we do open the space for critique and loving critique, right? So, and, and so I just, I wonder if both of you actually can talk a little bit about doing this thinking and this organizing, I guess in the context of Europe, right? Uh, as, a, as a place that is, I mean, it's like central to benefits from and separate from resource extraction in a particular way, right? So if we think about flows of harm and flows of capital, um, I really love not being North American centric and I think about, or just American centric actually, like all of the Americas. Um, and I think that colonialism shows up differently um, in how we're thinking about complicity. And so I, I'd love to think about that or hear you say something about that in relation to Reclaim the Power or in relation to XR. Sorry to jump in. Um, can I can I respond? Is that, yeah? Because it's- yeah, of course, go ahead. It's great to have this conversation, actually. Um, just on that last point, Alexis, I mean, um, you know, the Financial Secrecy Index from the Tax Justice Network is a very detailed methodology for working out um, where corruption services are centred in the world. And they're centred in the UK with the biggest providers, if you include our overseas territories and crown dependencies. So the Cayman Islands are top of the list, US is second, Switzerland third and so on. But when you add it all up, we're the biggest. So like, you know, I mean, and, and, and the reparations payments only finished in 2015, you know, for slave owners. So it, it's, it's really so super current um, colonialism. I mean, I, you know, God, oh, and it's, there's so much that I want to respond to. And I'm really like wanting to check in with my body around what I was saying about vulnerability and about separation. Cause like, obviously there's part of me just wants to be in totally like defensive mode as well. Um, uh, b before XR got going, we started this thing called Rising Up that you probably know about. And I was part of Reclaim the Power in terms of, you know, the anti-fracking actions and so on. And we and we and we called uh, strategy meetings, and um, you know when you're like yet another nobody, nobody comes to these things, or they're not. You know, it was like we asked Mr. Duncourt and BLM, and let's have a you know where's the strategy here? And um, we were very deliberate in trying to pick a different form of language, uh, and that 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 would not be like the kind of left 
bubble echo chamber language that many of us would recognize um, but other people would bounce off of um, and I want to mention before I go on another brilliant piece I don't know we're in the Mickey Cashdown fan club today but called convergent facilitation which is a process by which we find the non-controversial essence in what we're trying to do and bring it together. And I think the mistake of XR was to try and do something for strategic and tactical reasons. Uh, and that set aside the sort of moral point of owning our colonial history, talking about the economic system. I've just put two things in the chat channel, by the way. I hope you really like Money Rebellion if you haven't come across it yet. Um, and you'll see the other one, holistic theories, is older, but it's more detailed in terms of my thinking about the different theories of change that are going off at the same time. But um, yeah, it's, I think that two things ended up have felt separated and, and, and most clearly in the US where there's been a, a kind of fight. And I don't particularly want to comment on it because I'm not there and I'm not you know, over all the detail of it, but about a fourth demand and, and other people saying we want to really make sure the third demand's clear that it's like, you know, the third demand in XR is about citizens assembly. It's like Greek, early forms of Greek democracy. It's like completely radical, but it sounds, um, I mean, I'm, I'm careful what I say online because I just know somebody will grab the footage and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's really radical, the third demand anyway. Um, uh, uh, but it sounds reasonable because it is as well, because actually radical stuff is really reasonable. And so we pick our language pretty carefully. Right. Um, and I think the thing again about the both and is, and I mentioned convergent facilitation, how do we bring these parts of ourselves together and weave them back together again so that we, we, we meet clearly all the different uh, requirements of, um, of a movement, you know, especially frankly, a movement being that built, in a country that's deeply racist, that hasn't done its work, you know, it hasn't, the environmental movement hasn't done its work. And by the way, a defensive thing to say, we have run about a hundred workshops in XR UK on decolonialization, anti-oppression and so on. And right from the start, we set up XR Internationalist Solidarity Network, uh, whereby something like 20% of the crowdfunder, and there's been about sharing across the world, but it's been shared led by the Stop the Matt Anger Measy folks. You say this stuff and you think, oh, we, we haven't really gone on about it before because it sort of sounds like virtue signaling. And, you know, anyway, it's it's a tricky, a tricky space um, to think clearly about because I to take the capitalism point, right, um, and you'll see with Money Rebellion, um, you won't hear me saying I'm anti-capitalist. And, and the reason is I just... I think it, it, it creates polarity because people think, okay, anti-capitalists, you, you're against businesses. You, you think markets are always a bad thing. And then another point would be, there's a whole pile of um, uh, people who see neoliberalism as a completely corrupted form. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an economic system anymore. It, 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 I mean, and I think it's a logical, uh, the, the, the logical direction that, that capitalism is going to go into. But for some, it's a question of uh, corruption. And well, if we would internalize the externalities of, of, of the economics, we could still have some form of market system. Da -da. Anyway, the point I'm really trying to make is there's nuance in that conversation. And and if, if, if there's like a line down the middle of the screen where like there's people who think they're anti-capitalist, people who think they're pro, the, the conversation that happens here is, is interesting. When it gets over here, it gets into like true polarity. And what um, I think is is what we're calling for in, in Extinction Rebellion is a global citizens assembly and assemblies at other uh, levels to rewire humanity. To, to, I mean, we've actually got a team working on that at the minute um, to rewire the political economy. And have like I, the phrase I use is a grown up, grown up conversation about it. So it, it's like, how do we uh, talk about these things in a way that brings more togetherness, including operating within a in a in a, a, a racist world? And and so, Alice, just you know, from what you were saying, and I don't know if you've seen Money Rebellion stuff, but that progression's uh, there uh, in terms of 
talking about the next step. Um, it's been our strategy from the start of the year is to talk about systemic issues. And um, we have to bring people with us. Um, that's, you know, and, and, and we, we need to pick our language carefully, in my opinion. So I hope that made sense anyway. Um, yeah. Can I, can I come back on that? Um, so yeah, I think it, it's interesting, and isn't it? And I think that um, often uh, Extinction Rebellion, it's, you know, you say about togetherness and you say about picking your language carefully. And certainly, um, you know, I, I feel a sense of inauthenticity a lot of the time with regards to what the uh, leaders of Extinction Rebellion or the spokespeople of Extinction Rebellion say and then what they think. And I think that I find that um, difficult because it's like, okay, I know Roger Hallam is saying this because he's hoping X, Y, Z will come about as a result of this, um, rather than what he actually thinks, rather than what his, you know, his authentic self um, would actually, would actually uh, determine. And I think that sometimes when we seek togetherness above everything else we actually we favor some people in society over others unintentionally and so when you have a, a language which is kind of universal okay we can't be explicitly anti-capitalist in fact we're going to be explicitly anti the anti-capitalists as with a recent tweet then you're putting off a whole swathe of anti-capitalists that may be involved with extinction rebellion and the same goes for for race and justice issues and and i really appreciate the responsiveness that the reflexiveness that's happened with extinction rebellion but by the same token you know of saying okay we're going to reach this kind of universality this togetherness who is it inadvertently that you're putting off or you're not able to make those connections with without a recognition of you know what that togetherness might entail like a privileging of the white middle class environmental activist as opposed to someone that might be um, black or minority ethnic and can't put themselves in the firing line when it comes to police or you know when they, it, they would feel deeply uncomfortable with making chants to the police saying that we love you, we love you, we do this for your children too. Um, and so I think sometimes in the, in the, in the seeking of, of togetherness, we can actually inadvertently put other people off. And I think that when it comes to anti-capitalism, you know, I'm a millennial, I'll be 30 in, in, um, in a couple of months time. And a recent survey said, and this, this is the same Alexis in North America, that of like over 50% of millennials are anti-capitalist and socialists. And there is that, that appetite, there is that notion there of what, um, you know, the way in, in which they have an anti-capitalist uh, ideology. And I think that by actively dismissing that or actively saying, no, we are not, we are not anti-capitalist. Um, we don't support this banner that says uh, socialism or extinction. You are actively putting off those people that might otherwise be, otherwise be involved and also increase the diversity and the plurality and the heterogeneity of the movement. Um, and I think polarity isn't something that should necessarily be a negative thing. You know, I don't think polarity needs to be a negative thing. I think that polars attract, right? That's, that's, that's how they operate, like polars attract. And I think in, um, you know, the 3.5% rule of we have to get a certain amount of people um, activated within the population to achieve uh, significant change. I think it often then manifests in a way that seeks this togetherness above and beyond a kind of authenticity, um, a kind of uh, a recognition of the way that climate intersects with with um, you know race, class, 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 patriarchy, and capital. And I think that you know it, certainly in the UK context, this argument holds a lot of saliency, right? And lots I hear it from lots of XR activists all of the time. Well, we can't be explicit in this way because we'll put people off and it's a numbers game we have to have mass mobilization 
globalization, right? And I think if I'd never been out of the UK environmentalist context, I'd probably believe the same. But the thing is, at Endergelenda in Germany, it's become the largest mobilization of people taking direct action for climate justice in Europe, potentially the world, but we're not sure about that, but certainly within Europe. So, I mean, last year alone in June, there were 7,000 people at camp and they're not they're not people mobilized to shut down uh, central you know business districts and streets in capital cities they're people mobilized to physically break through police lines and shut down fossil capitalist infrastructure at the source and so i think that it's you know, I, I appreciate the togetherness and I appreciate that uh, aspect. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that we don't need to have a kind of universality or a saliency to every single person on the political spectrum in order to achieve those numbers. Those numbers can be achieved in a determined, determinedly, um, deterministically radical and intersectional way with a with a climate justice focus and there's been clear examples of that and it's not just Ender Galenda as well the Italian climate camp movement they had their first climate camp last year and they've had their second one and over a thousand people ready to take on fossil fuel infrastructure and it's it's so empowering and so inspiring to be part of these movements and and do so in a way that i know that i can be my authentic self i know that i can um like have uh kind of you know go to the source of, of fossil capital and i think that uh with the the strategy of shutting down lots of um roads in, in in capital cities that's an interesting approach and certainly it works to, to garner the media media's attention initially but i i'm sure you'd appreciate as well that the media attention has gone down somewhat and that if you kind of keep replicating the same strategy then the media the way that the media operates they go off it after a while don't they and it it amounts to me not a really um, true sense of the word of, of non-violent direct action in that it's an elaborate petitioning of the government for the government to meet these demands. Now, if, when we recognise that the government goes hand in hand with fossil capital and works to service them, then we know that like even the most elaborate of, of petitioning of government isn't necessarily going to achieve the change that we need to see. And so I guess that's why with Reclaim the Power and End the Glenda and lots of these a climate justice movement they take the direct side of the direct action to its logical conclusion which is to go right to the very source so that is fossil fuel infrastructure the, the, the heads like the um central offices of the, the companies doing this ecocidal destruction and um you know and, and acting in that way and so i think that yeah, kind of going back to the togetherness, like I feel a great sense of togetherness with the people that I know we can, we have an incredible sense of togetherness at Ender Galenda because we we have this such an intense shared sense of purpose and being part of the internationals of there, I know that English might be a second language for people and they don't even understand it very well in some cases, but yet we have such a clarity and purpose, such an intense sense of togetherness that allows allows us to take on fossil capital right at the very source and do so in a way that is 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 incredible and beautiful and wonderful and and I I feel such a sense of empowerment and togetherness to be part of a radical explicitly anti-capitalist climate justice movement. Could I maybe quickly <laughs> jump in here because uh, I really like your token about like all different approaches because it is of course it's a question how you how you put these these thoughts and these beliefs and these pra into practice um and it's also like something that i want to pick up uh pick up because um another thought that i that i got when i was reading your uh, essay alexis against the against purity one um you wrote and i quote purism is a decollectivizing demobilizing paradoxical politics of despair um, I think this also connects to this idea of togetherness as well, whereas you say that this politics of purism is actually doing the complete opposite. Um, yet I do think that this feeling of despair is also a very sincere feeling when it comes to, to climate change. I think we all 
sometimes feel uh, grief and anger and fear as well when we see uh, the likely societal collapse that is that is nearing, that is coming uh, closer. Um, but I was wondering how, uh, if you could suggest somehow we can create a politics that, that does recognize these feelings of grief, anger, despair, yet also manages to go beyond um, this, to not create this demobilization and this sense of maybe helplessness. Yeah, I mean, sure, I'm happy to say something about that. And I'm thinking about it in relation to this very important conversation that's happening. Um, so I sort of don't want to take us too far off that conversation. So I'll say something and see if it connects in. Um, because I think a lot of the time when we're looking at um, what sometimes is talked about as the difference between um, vanguardism or volunteerism and collective organizing, um, some of the threads of conversation that are happening between Ellis and Gail are also showing up there, right? Do we need to have just a small number of people who do the right thing? Um, and, and what counts as a small or a large number of people? And um, do we do we have a crew? So vanguardism as a, an approach um, from sort of um, Maoism, Stalinism, right? Like, do we have just a few people who are really educated in the issues, fully understand the complexity of everything, and they they lay the line for the um, as Lenin said, the bricklayers to have a make a straight wall, or do we have uh, an approach that is um, grounding itself in a kind of collective wisdom, collective um, possibility? I'm I'm personally a, a really uh, super anti-vanguardist um, thinker. I think we uh, do best to um, trust that people are intelligent, although frequently misled or misguided uh, or undereducated. So I believe in education and the possibility of transformation so much. Um, and I also believe in starting from where people are. Um, and I believe in uh, identifying an enemy and not pretending that we don't have enemies. I think all of us here agree. Um, we have enemies, they hate us. Um, like, and, and personally, I can have a feeling of like, uh, well, I actually am working for a world in which um, things are better. And so it doesn't matter to me that white supremacists hate me. Um, I welcome their hatred, right? And I am interested in it. Um, for a lot of people, um, like all of us, we look and it's like, everything is so awful. Um, as soon as you start looking, it just brings tears to your eyes. Um, and many of us can respond to that by organizing, right? By coming together. And I think for people, I, I started thinking about political despair and political purity as a form of despair because I had a lot of friends, comrades, who had done really intense, wonderful activist work for many years. Um, so I've been, you know, I've been organizing for 25 years. Um, and I saw a lot of people who were like, I did all this stuff and it didn't work. And now I'm just going to try to find a nice place to live out uh, the collapse of civilization. I'm going off grid, I'm learning to do these various things. And, and when I think about that impulse as a purity move, and as a a thing that actually just produces more despair. The thing that I'm interested in there is how can we look at every instance where we want to take seriously and be um, authentic and truthful about how bad things are and use that as a point of connection um, and as a way to uh, invite something, invite some kind of movement. Mm -hmm. So, I'm very interested in being really honest with each other about what's different and how we organize and how we analyze. And I'm very interested in how we can do that in a way that sparks um, this possibility of saying, um, we're gonna oppose anything that decollectivizes. We're gonna oppose anything that demobilizes. Mm -hmm. We're gonna oppose anything that produces more despair. 
Now, I really do think like here in Ottawa, some of the deepest fights that um, climate, justice act climate justice activists have had have been around the question, exactly these questions. So these are shared, you know, everywhere around the question of do we do we shut down the bridge downtown or do we go and shut down the um, the places where you can turn off oil pipelines are actually pretty easy to get to. Um, do we shut down the bridge downtown? Do we shut down the oil pipeline? Do we shut down the, the rail that's um, shipping? Um, so, so the question always for me is, if we start from this approach that we don't actually know, and we're not gonna pretend that we're always right. Like, in fact, we're gonna start from being like, probably we're getting a lot of stuff wrong, but let's ask who's our shared enemy? Who can we stand in solidarity with? Where that quality of solidarity is, how can we recognize uh, reaching together across a difference and across fucking up um, as the ground for action? Like I actually feel like those two things together get us a long way. Um, and, and I guess like, I was like, just here, I was sort of feeling like, ah, oh, I feel kind of uncomfortable. Like I want Gail and Alice, who I literally have never met before today to like be happy together. And then I was feeling like, no, how great it is that we can have these kind of sparky interchanges that take seriously, what are we, what world are we working on here? Wait, what shared world are we working for? Anyway, that rambled, I'm sorry, yeah. It's fine, thank you. I, I appreciated what you were saying because I think it, it's going back to what I was trying to say about the both and rather than the either or. I, I, I did start to experience that, um, what you were saying, Alice, even there's so many threads in it, it's hard to grab, you know, we, we would need a five hour conversation to go through them and, and talk in more detail, um, I think. Uh, so I'm more, and I and you could speak to some of them, but I'm more sitting in that place where it's sort of, we've been set up as this either or, like it feels like a battle, it starts to feel like a battle, I can feel it in my body, it's like, you know, um, and I, I don't, I don't, um, you know, what, what, what Kofi speaks about who runs our XRISN work is, is like the broad canopy to come under the shade of a tree together and not expect us all to have the same sense of theory of change or what our particular purpose and role is or what the best strategy, strategy or tactics going to be. And um, I, I, I don't, well, I, I certainly for myself wouldn't say that I speak in, in authentic ways, by the way, I don't, I don't recognize that. If, if anything, I'm just, you know, occasionally trying to think uh how it how it might play out if it got into you, you know that i like my name's been all over breitbart the press have been at my sister's house my mum's house you know my kid's house it's it's there's there's a little bit of protection around how i say things um but that because i just know it's going to blow up i know the media team will have a, a job on and so on you know so you, if you and I was having a chat I'd talk differently to something that's being recorded there's a there's a bit of that going off that's all and it's just as a self-protection in it a protection of um, teams and so on but um I think that I'm I'm sort of interested in the in the both the, the chaos that we're experiencing right now I mean like like I, there's these conversations to be had and I don't want to use the word togetherness that's sort of trying to smooth over some like really different senses of how to go about things um or uh you know some of the 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 uh, things that you're raising Alice that are concerns about who who feels like they can join under that canopy you know who, who feels like that's just not my place you know these indulgent white people just don't get it or whatever um, I honestly understand. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at the world and looking at, you know, the QAnon conspiracies, um, just how rapidly that's mobilizing people. I'm looking at the opportunity of the social dilemma on Netflix at the minute that's, you know, finally at the end of, of that, 
film, I don't know if people have seen it yet, but talks about um, the business model. They don't use the C word, but they do talk about the business model, like the money, but basically the, the, the social dilemma is about um, the, the weaponization of tech to destroy our democracy and the people that actually created the weapons and didn't really fully realize what they were doing and the horror of what they've done. Um, it's a really interesting space that's been opened by that 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 place the QAnon conspiracy and so many of us watching our friends um sharing pandemic videos or, or whatever um you know there's it's my understanding is that the, the this uh system that we're in is going into descending into hell i mean to my mind fascism's here already uh and and it's been very cleverly worked. I mean, I was not interested. I was talking to a friend today about whether Trump's actually got COVID, you know, or this is like a mechanism for, it's a trick. Anyway, who knows? Um, in, in these times, like what seeds are we sowing? You know, what seeds are we sowing for the changes that we want uh, in our democratic, I mean, we don't have a functioning democracy as far as I'm concerned, but this is the, the whole point of saying about citizens assemblies and to and to try and talk to um that disarray and that confusion and that um uh deliberate setting people up to uh not be able to make sense of the world anymore to think that that you know before they know somebody who's got legitimate in my view anyway concerns about vaccines um suddenly are like on the streets with the far right you know this is what's happening and it's it's gonna come in in the uk in like rapid fire it's 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 building really quickly and i think we have to um look at this time in terms of what what we need to what we need to be saying um and how to say it in a way that will bring the mass a, a big body of people around a new form of democracy um Can I respond to a couple of those things? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting and I have deep concerns about the QAnon um, conspiracy stuff. And I guess what I've seen as well, so living in uh, the Calder Valley, uh, where I live in Yorkshire uh, near Hebden Bridge, is a lot of people that would or have been historically involved in the environmental movement. So things like Earth First or you know, uh, road protests or things like that, that would have been, that were involved. And I guess, you know, kind of going back to what you were saying, Alexis, people that have found such a level of despair that it's more about creating their little corner of the world to, to exist in and to kind of, to live uh, off the grid as much as possible um, and kind of take, uh, environmental lifestyleism to its logical conclusion which is just kind of looking out for your own and uh and being in um being in a space that you know you can say is the most ecologically sustainable or whatever you know and i'm not saying that everyone in that area is like that at all but there are quite a few people that um i would i would put down um as as people believing things like that that have then gone on to believe the QAnon conspiracy theory stuff and I guess that this is, I, I would say, part of the problem with not having a coherent ideology or a coherent set of politics, if in fact having a politics that is to say that we're beyond politics or, you know, we don't do politics or whatever, you know, I think that that can very easily, the cosmic left or, um, you know, that, that kind of level of spirituality, unfortunately, can be co-opted really easily by the right and we're seeing that and it's gravely concerning because people that have been historically involved in environmental struggles and I would put kind of as latent people amongst a counterculture attached to environmentalism are very quickly going down this route and so I think that's kind of the danger of, of, a, of an incoherent ideology that's the, the danger in which it can go down is if, if you don't have the politics and I remember having I had a conflict um, an argument with someone 
who um, in Hebden Bridge, she wouldn't shake my, um, sorry, I wouldn't shake her hand. She offered me her hand. I wouldn't shake her hand because of coronavirus. And um, she got really upset with me for believing in coronavirus and demanding to know who I, I knew that had died of coronavirus and of which I said a friend's a father, unfortunately, had passed away and it's deeply sad. Um, but she, uh, yes, yeah, when she asked me what, what sources I was looking at, what my media was, uh, and when I and when I said uh, Navarra Media, a left wing media channel in the UK, um, she said, that's your problem. That's your problem is politics, is politics. And I think that there is a big crossover between the notion that XR has of being beyond politics or we don't have, a, you know, a politics. And it kind of gives leverage. It gives um yeah a, a legitimacy to people that kind of of that persuasion anyway or perhaps are kind of going down that route in in not having a thorough politics and and it's deeply concerning and i mean you know if if i'm being fully charitable to xr uh the beyond politics i see as a you know a, a canny um slogan to say this is beyond parliamentary politics right you know when we're being charitable, <laughs> when I'm being charitable. But unfortunately, I think that a lot of people then take that as read to be, okay, well, that's politics per se, you know, that's all politics. And, and when we kind of reinforce people's notion that politics is only about parliament and nothing else, it's just about parliamentary politics. And we don't recognize the thing that most first year politics students are taught the first day that they do politics as an undergrad, which is politics is about power. And when we think about power and we think about climate injustice, then we can't look at climate injustice without looking at power. And we can't look at it without looking at politics. And so, yeah, I guess, I mean, Gail, unfortunately, I, um, you know, it doesn't surprise me that you have friends on Facebook that are, are sharing conspiracy theory stuff, because I think a lot of Gen X people are, and I'm, I'm glad that I don't, but it is worrying because, you know, we're fighting the same struggle and we're, we're on the same side and yet people are slipping into the right. And that is of great concern. And I, I think that when you try and appeal across the political spectrum and actively try and cultivate appeal from the right with the notions of familyhood and the notions of like generational uh, entitlement um, and things like that, I think that it can play into the right very easily. Um, and I mean, so I was part of a, a survey recently we did a survey of Extinction Rebellion activists, a quantitative uh, research survey, me and some other academics. Um, and we surveyed lots of people at Extinction Rebellion protests. And lo and behold, I mean, it's of no surprise to me, but most XR activists were above average involved in the Green Party and the Labour Party. And I, I don't think that would come as a surprise to you either, Gail. But I think it, it, it really shows or is testament to the fact that the the strategy or the approach of, of being universal across the political spectrum and indeed not having a politics at all hasn't actually successfully mobilized people um, from the right or even like a great deal from the center ground people that were kind of you know a bit lefty anyway and and, and when we look at the demographic reality of xr that is the case so you know i don't know I don't know why. I don't know why there's 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 that need to appeal to the right. They're climate skeptics anyway. <laughs> like I'm not interested, as uh, Alexis uh, was saying, in um, you know appealing to those kinds of people. So yeah. Just to clarify, I mean, beyond politics is exactly about beyond party politics, and our third demand is about citizens assemblies right i mean this is the the whole point of a citizens assembly is it's demographically representative of the country a uh, global citizens assembly would have very few people with my skin color on it you know that's where we're uh, aiming for it's absolutely political nobody's saying it's not political the 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 the, the, the politics is coming from um what I would say is, is to, to use one phrase, is like the, the sort of emergence of teal thinking in these times or integral thinking. So moving beyond the sort of green uh, progressive left into sort of trying to look 
down uh, look look at, at different value structures as politicians have done, and to understand that that shows that you know you know. So, for example, you know, like my I've a working class family background. My dad was a miner. Um, the, the the sort of you know you you come with a I'm I'm getting a little bit. I'm doing. I'm just sitting in defensiveness. I don't really appreciate. How, I don't really want to do that. And I've been on XR stuff where people put climate change as a is a class issue, and I've gone, ugh. You know, like I give a fuck beyond I can express about what's happened to uh, my community and so on. I just don't think it works on the banner. You know, I just don't think it helps. So it's like not so much of this is is tactical but anyway the um the 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 the, the piece around bringing in citizens assemblies as like as a um s like supreme authorities is like as about as radical as you can get that's why i don't understand about the cr critiquing of beyond politics because we want a citizens assembly we want people ordinary people to decide you know it's 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 like and and this whole left right thing is because actually in reality many people are different but it's not a line is it? it's not linear it's in three dimensions so but i'm i you know i'm i i'm just not feeling that that form of conversation is it, 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 it's like a lot of information and you just end up moving into sort of defensiveness really I mean what I really want to do is not obviously not time here but is is talk about what's what you know what is the strategy around resisting what's happening which is the descent into fascism like you might not think XR strategy is correct uh, but it's what's happening at the minute, isn't it? So whatever strategies the progressive left are doing at the minute, I don't think they're working. You know, so we've tried something different. Let's get the data on that, what's useful, what's not. You know, Roger's set up a different radical flank um, called Burning Pink. That's what he's up to at the minute. Like, what's the, you know, what do we need to do next? I think it's like, and to wanting to come at that conversation not in defense mode but in humility mode of like actually do you know it's not fucking working is it like um and i don't i don't think it's because we haven't done enough of one thing that we've been trying for years which is to bang on about um you know a a a, 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 a particular ideology when all the money's captured all the think tanks and all the rest of it and it's it, you, you know anyway I, I think there's a lot of tactics to discuss here, frankly. Maybe I want to take use of this, uh, of this opportunity because we received the question as well from the audience and it also connects to this, yeah, to this, pol to this politics and also the feeling of despair because the person in the audience asks us how we can connect the struggles of the refugees and their fights with environmental activism, which is of course something this discussion has already uh, touched upon, um, but this person would like to know how we can connect it and what it would lead to. If some of you could, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I can I could come on that because uh, Reclaim the Power last year, we organized uh, our camp Power Beyond Borders, and it was explicitly uh, organized to connect climate justice with migrant justice and the intersections between race and climate. And so, and I think this comes down to, you know, our differing theories of change, Gail. It's like, you know, my, my theory of change is that um, you kind of, if you silo off the movements, then you're not connecting and you're not uh, achieving that overall change. And when you appreciate the intersectionalities, you can actively join with other movements. And so if you join with more and more movements, then you can achieve like a great level of change in in actively cultivating those um you know working together so that's what we did at reclaim the power last year is we said okay you know we really want to be really clear in um how the migrant struggle is um part of the same struggle of climate injustice and that um you know with with migration um 
when migrants come to the UK, I can only speak about the UK context, is that they're faced with a horrible hostile environment. People will be detained. Uh, people will be um, um, deported. And we set up the Power Beyond Borders camp in relation to the Stansted 15 struggle, which was to take direct action um, in solidarity with migrants and to stop a flight taking off that was due to deport migrants. And so in deciding that we wanted to do this and deciding, OK, we have this desire and want to connect struggles, it wasn't a case of, OK, like, how do we get them to come to us? You know, how do we get our movement to be more like diverse or get, you know, migrant stuff within our movement and within our protest camp and our actions and stuff? It wasn't done in that way. The way that we went about it was go, OK, what is it that we can offer to migrants and migrant solidarity groups and anti-racist groups. What is it, what are our skills that we have? What is in our repertoire that we can actively offer and say, take your pick. What is it that we can, we can help you with in recognizing that, you know, it can be a very privileged position for uh, a non-white person to be on a protest camp or to do a direct action and things like that. So when we did that really delicate and um, uh, quite long winded work of like making sure that we were um, completely um, aware of the environmental movements, history of kind of, of white supremacy and acting uh, in an inadvertently racist way. And we, when we recognize that and when we offer something, um, then we can work together on this. And when we work together on this, we can build a much bigger and a much more robust movement. And um, so we had two days of action at Power Beyond Borders. We had an action outside the Home Office, which was to say that um, the hostile environment is racist, um, that this is uh, treating people in a really inhumane way. And then the second day we did an action um, against fossil gas. And the whole point of the camp was linking the two together and saying, okay, what are the commonalities? Well, the commonality between fighting against ecocidal fossil fuel capitalism and the, com and the commonality with fighting against racist white supremacist capitalism is capitalism, right? That's the common denominator. That's the way that we are linked together. And when we recognize that the reason why um, the global South is gonna be the worst affected with climate change and why there's, there's wars that we've created in uh, the Middle East and elsewhere as like a British empire, um, and why there's such material inequality. It's not an unhappy accident of, of human history. It's because of colonialism and colonial um, capitalism that's created this situation and will mean that people in the global south are going to be the worst affected, not as an unhappy result of geography, but because this has been a system that has been in place um, for hundreds of years. And so when we recognise that and we were able to do so and reach out to those groups and actively collaborate, we had the most diverse climate camp I've ever seen and I've been in the movement for 10 years and it was incredible you know because you I think too often as white activists you bang on about oh you know or like oh, there's just too many white people or whatever it's like okay well what are you going to do about it then are you going to expect people to come to you or are you going to go to people you know hat in hand and say okay what is it that we can offer you and I and I think that that was really good and I'm really glad that we did that and for me that's what the you know, my theory of change is it's connecting those struggles and finding the common denominator, which is capitalism. Right. I think Gail maybe also wants to, uh, yeah, address address a question that, that was asked because you already referred to it. You already referred to the Extinction Rebellion, money rebellion tactics uh, early in the beginning of the conversation. You were so uh, uh, welcome to share the, the link in, in our Zoom chat. Of course, the people following the live stream might not be able to see that. Um, but can you maybe expand a bit on that? Sure, yeah, thanks. And I had a shared joy in that way, Alice, um, this August at the reparations groundings in Brixton. Um, but I feel like I've just virtue signals by saying even that really. Um, I, I mean, I agree. So, um, so we're, 
pivoting now um, to something called money rebellion, which is to look at um, the different forms of resistances that we can do and to look at economic civil disobedience. I mean, Alice was talking, I think, a lot about physical counter power that we can use when we can do uh, blockades. And obviously they tend to be um, not always, but sometimes symbolic, like they happen for a day or whatever. We've got a lot of XR activists at HS2 sites at the minute in the UK, the anti-fracking movement in the UK, I think, and other factors, but was successful in stopping that industry. That's physical counter power. There's the idea counter power when you, you, know, you do um, things that shift people's uh, sense of things that, you know watching rabbis and and scientists and whatever being carted off and arrested has has been part of what shifted the conversation in the in, in the world um so economic counterpower is really tricky to achieve as far as i understand again i'd be interested in alexis and alice's view on this but certainly in the uk the the, the trade unions have had their teeth removed uh, over many years. Um, organizing strike actions are, are really difficult. Some of us, are, many of us work for ourselves or uh, work on um, contracts that are, uh, you know, zero hours and so on. Um, so the idea with Money Rebellion is looking at the opportunities around uh, tax and um, debt and resistances therein. Uh, so I've shared a video that gives something of the background and I think Alice you'll be mostly reassured when you if you take the time if you have the time to watch that you won't be entirely there'll be things that annoy you I'm sure but um, I'll, I'll leave you my email maybe we could talk some more um, uh, so the, the sort of you know the analysis of 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 of, of growthism of, of 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 the profit motive and and so on so then in terms of tactics there are a few things the sort of foundational tactic is what you'd call a conditional commitment which is would you do this if other people would join you so um would you not pay your council tax in a, in a specific area if other people would join you or would you not pay your mortgage debt and i know everybody's got mortgage debts if other people would join you so like would it be 5,000 people, 10,000, 50,000? And because of the scale of XR, and um, we have this um, software called Coal Hub, uh, you can get on and, and phone people up and, and ask those questions. So we can build up um, the threat in that way. Some of the sort of, um, when you talked about vanguardism and Alexis, I'm not sure I fully understood. It'd be interesting to hear more, but what I mean by vanguard action is an action that's a demonstrator that kind of whets the appetite, if you see what I mean. So the vanguard actions that we're looking at at the minute, one is um, where we're taking out credit cards with certain banks. And again, it's a use of privilege point, Alice, but and making reparations on behalf of that bank by making donations um, at the minutes to Survival International. Um, it could be um, also the Acacia School in High Wycombe. I've been talking to those, it's a, 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 a complementary school uh, focused on African diaspora communities. Um, so making reparations in, in and, and then asking the bank to write off the debts um, and with match funds. So. Uh, coming alongside as animal rebellion because of Barclays and Cargill, uh, industrial an animal agriculture, and then around um, taxes, small businesses and or other people who do tax returns as well as another possibility. Uh, but I, 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 anyway, the, the point of it is two levels. One is to talk about a, whatever the particular action is, it may talk about what Barclays Bank are doing in the world or whichever bank it is. Um, but also the meta point is we need to have a, the way I say it is a grown up conversation about our political economy, uh, the destruction of democracy to the profit motive, the destruction of the environment and social good and social well-being to um, to, to economic growth. So that's what the, 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 the point of that is. And um, I think it's, you know, in terms of movement of movements of solidarity actions, it's like how to build solidarity between those that can't pay and those that are choosing not to pay. So it's talking to taxpayers against poverty recently. Um, and and um, th there's a whole pile of, uh, and I've nearly finished with the ramble, but it's a whole pile of, um, shame that's put on people around debt. Uh, that's why the banks look like temples, right? I mean, to, to make us feel that we have to 
pay and to and, and wanting to build that uh, piece as well as part of so, so that's so something that we're working on at the minute thank you really great to hear the both of you um how you respond to uh, to the question that, that arrived from the audience um seeing it looking at the time we already passed the hour but i would love to hear alexis once more um i'm also going to quote you again um see i was very inspired by all the writing basically i found on the that you wrote apparently um but some time ago in the midst of the corona pandemic actually you uh, wrote an article uh, called survival will always be sufficient um but it's a good place to start um, and in that article, you refer to the dire situations a huge part of uh, the global community was confronted with uh, during the corona pandemic. Um, and in which you also emphasize that we should always start with survival and primarily that we should fight for the lives of the people targeted by the death cult of capitalism. Yet you also in, in that article state that survival alone is not enough, um, that people not only need bread, that they need roses as well, to, um, to paraphrase the well-known labor slogan. But today it seems there isn't a political program yet that uh, can lay out what comes after the survival or what precisely these roses um, would be. So I wanted to wrap up this conversation by asking you, Alexis, if uh, you could maybe tell us what you feel these roses could be for you. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I think um, that labor slogan, we need bread, but we need roses is, is actually such a profound anti-capitalist slogan. And it speaks back to that quality of shame in poverty or shame in debt. And it also speaks to this um, insight that we can have many different theories of change. And as long as they're not actively opposing each other, right, or shutting each other down, uh, they can actually, we don't know what will create the world in which um, lives can flourish and lives can continue. So having this commitment to ease and flourishing and joy um, for me is one of the most uh, gorgeous anti-capitalist affects that we can have and model. Um, and it, it comes to this place that also returns to the very beginning of our conversation about resisting logics of scarcity and saying, we refuse to accept the idea that there isn't enough for everyone. We know that there is enough for everyone and that it's just massively badly di distributed. So coming back to the question of migrants and climate refugees, you know, in our movements, we absolutely need to say no to any logic that comes down to ecofascism or that allows ecofascism to exist. And I would say that in every place that I am seeing climate organizing happen, there is a right wing tendency that is protectionist, isolationist, and that believes that the way for us to resist climate catastrophe is to shut borders and protect the people inside. So I think when we look at what it means to say roses for everyone, right? What one thing that allows us to do is affirm that joy is a major motivator for us to believe in this world and to work together toward a world in which many worlds can live, to echo the Zapatistas, right? So they said, we have many yeses, we have one no, right? But we don't know all the yeses that could exist. So in our movements and in this conversation, I think one of the things is interesting, useful for us to say is we can actually share this commitment to um, a core no, right? And that means if we don't say um, racism and ecofascism is not a part of this political program, that's not a theory of change that is, right? Like if, there, if we're doing movement work that um, holds space for those approaches, that's not a hospitable theory of change. It, we can't stand shoulder to shoulder, even with different movements. Um, so we have these like bases of unity and I do really feel like the approach of, um, yeah, finding the possibilities for unapologetic joy is uh, useful, like politically, strategically, tactically useful. Um, yeah, there's so many, we could keep talking for hours. <laughs> But yes. yes, capitalism is a death cult and we should resist it. We should be for life. 
I think that's also like a very beautiful and a very strong idea of feeling to keep with us and to wrap this conversation up for today. Because as you said, we can continue having this conversation. It's important to continue um, having this conversation, but I'm very, I feel very privileged and honored that we managed uh, to already address very interesting topics. And um, now we had this beautiful conversation tonight for which I would really like to thank you. Uh, I feel very privileged that I was able to uh, invite you all to uh, our School of Resistance. I hope you also enjoyed the talk. Um, and the only thing that is now left for me to do is to announce our, our, our next episode, which uh, will take place on Saturday this time, Saturday the 17th of October at 6 p.m. Our guest for that episode will be Achille Mbembe, and uh, together with Milo Rao, they will discuss um, the paranoia of the Western mind. Um, I think that's all for tonight. And uh, I wish you all a lovely evening. And I would love to uh, have a chat together once near.